Hi, this is Phil Newman from Longevity Technology, and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by the Executive Chair of Juvenescence, Mr. Greg Bailey. Greg. Good to see you, Phil. Yeah, and uh, great to see you, Greg. And of course, uh, we're talking ahead of the uh, Longevity Investors Conference, which is coming up in uh, in a short period of time. So while we're in the midst of the sort of summer break, good to, to take the time to have a conversation with you about what's happening at, uh, at Juvenescence. And of course, uh, I had the... Um, the delight of meeting Richard and, and talking with him, Richard Marshall, your your new CEO, who was appointed earlier this year. So, um, you know, what, what's he bringing to Juvenescence now with the organizational change that you've been through? I sort of feel like the warm up band for the Rolling Stones, given Richard's background in drug development. Um, you know, thirty two new chemical entities approved in twenty twenty two, and Richard delivered five in four years at AstraZeneca, which is just astonishing, including the vaccine and the antibody for which he was the only one who received a CBE from the Queen of England for drug development at AstraZeneca. So impressive track record. He's hit the ground running. What he's really done that's uh, exciting from my perspective as a shareholder and as executive chair is the fact that he not only sees our drug in the context of getting them into clinical trials, but when they can be monetized. And a number of them are on pathways that the world has been seeking for answers. And so you have a very early opportunity to monetize in a phase one clinical trial, as opposed to the classical phase two B. So Richard has brought some great insights into that and his knowledge of what big pharma is looking for at this point in time. And, and then just the drug development chops. Can I just ask you about that? Because that's, that's really interesting. So um, when you say monetizing in, in phase one, are you, are you saying that you're looking to a commercialize and license early or you know what 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 what's that mean in, 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 in practicality? Yeah, I mean everyone at Jew in essence agrees we're never hiring ten thousand sales reps. And if you have a drug that truly modifies how people age globally, you know, it, you've got to do a deal with Big Pharma for that global reach. You could do it by jurisdiction, but um, the optimum is prized to do it on a global program. And because of the breadth of a drug that truly modifies how you age. You know, your patient population is 8 billion people. You know, population for breast cancer, Europe, 245,000 women for prostate cancer, men, 235. These are just different metrics, 400 million Europeans. <clears throat> so he can see that these are pathways that uh, Big Farm is looking for. And so we'll be excited to see something and we'll come in, much like we saw with immuno oncology probably five years ago, where they knew this was a land grab and they came in very early with big numbers. Or pharmacyclic, um, and the hepatitis uh, medication that went for 12 billion after a phase two. So these have okay. these sort of powerful numbers associated with them. And so that was an enormously good insight, despite my background interacting with big pharma and selling products or companies to them, to have that view from the other side of the table has been extraordinary. That's interesting. So so rather than the end game, getting in earlier and, and collaborating at an earlier point. Uh, so so what are you focusing on at the moment? Are you looking at systemic um, longevity and rejuvenation or are you picking off some diseases on the way? Yeah, as you and I both know, there's no regulatory pathway if we had a drug today that allowed you to live 10 years longer healthy. So you have to take a conventional regulatory pathway uh, to get there. So yeah, focused on the low hanging fruit, what is the optimum pathology, which again, Richard has a tremendous expertise, along with Steve Felstad, who ran clinical drug development at Pfizer and is one of our employees, and Declan, who was former head of drug development at Pfizer. So where's the low hanging fruit? How do we get to that inflection point earlier, which is going to, you know, to, to move easily through the regulatory? The really exciting thing is, you know, we're beginning to hear this from Big Pharma, is they are mentally transitioning to what will be absolutely necessary for the economics of countries, and that's prevention. And mm -hmm. so I think when we get to the prevention level, then you're going to see a pathway towards modifying how you age, because if we can prevent disease, we obviously affect dramatically longevity and health span. Yeah. Well well, I'm sure we're going to come on to that later in terms of how that looks from a, an investor perspective. But, uh, Greg, are there any big stories that we can expect coming out of Juvenescence, perhaps uh, for the balance of this year, 2023? Yeah, uh, being a private company, it's a, we can actually say those sort of things. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to announce uh, 
a clinical trial this year uh, for a drug that has an interesting human model that shows that if you can modify that path, the PI1 pathway, that patient, you know, that the individuals live 10 years longer healthy, you know, so that would be huge to me. That would be profound. I'm hopeful that we can also uh, talk about a product that may prevent neurodegeneration and we'll have greater clarity this year. So yeah, some big upcoming milestones uh, from us. And hopefully, <laughs> since we're in the biotech winter, we'll be able to announce that uh, we've uh, raised a convertible loan note for $140 million. Oh, excellent. Well, that's, 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 that's great. And let's, let's talk about some of the financial mechanics that are sort of sitting perhaps organizationally with you, because we obviously saw that uh, Ajax canceled, you know, $36 million of, of debt through a stock exchange with Juvenis. And so yes. what, what does that mean for both companies? Um, it cleans their balance sheet, it, you know, continues their New York Stock Exchange listing. Um, it positions it as a clean entity to be able to look to do other projects, which we've been looking at for a while to try and find other exciting things we can bring in. We've made a loan to a company that we think is very, very compelling. And we are going to try and see how we can work best with this company. It's called Serena. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's positioned to hopefully see the glory days of before when it was trading at 2 and $3 a share. Okay, that's interesting. So, so is this basically going to be something where we can expect perhaps some pipe grind, pipeline progress from Ajax, or will we see Ajax on its traditional trajectory, but maybe a bit more from Juvenescence? Um, tough to say right now. You know, as it's a public company, uh, you know, is and there hasn't been any disclosure. So, I, w- I would say that all options are open. You know, we are completely focused at both companies, Juvenescence and at Ajax on optimizing shareholder value. So what can we do that will be most advantageous? There's enormous excitement in the area of regeneration, as you of all people know, and we have some technology in that area. And Mike West is looking to um, put that into a subsidiary that we finance independently to move forward on that, where the major shareholder would be the parent company. And then, as I said, there's also this other opportunity we're looking at. So. Exciting yeah. times. Excellent. And the exosomes. I'm excited about their program and exosomes and the fact that we're going to be in clinical trials, hopefully very soon, um, for Huntington's disease with Professor Leslie Thompson. Wow. So so obviously, just in relation to the, the financial aspects of what you mentioned there. So uh, Richard was talking before about preparing for your Series C. So um, have you effectively kind of closed that off now or will you be closing that um, imminently? No, uh, I wish it was imminently. Unfortunately, you know, it's tricky times. Um, we've switched it to convertible loan note. Um, we're going to go out with that in September. We have soft circled a lot of people from the Series C. And so we are guardedly optimistic that um, they'll change. I've been seeing deals close this last three weeks, maybe four, that I didn't expect to close. So um, not ours, but just other companies. And so I, th- I think the winds are shifting. And Okay. Certainly an enormous amount of money was raised last year by four funds. I think it was $14 billion. So they got to deploy it. And, then, and to the best of my knowledge, they haven't been deploying. And then there's obviously Evolution that has a big uh, ticket that they need to deploy. And I don't think, unless you know differently, that they've deployed very much of that money. No, that's right. I mean, there, there obviously is quite a lot of uh, appetite for the work that's going on in longevity, but it is, as you say, the uh, the biotech winter is is extending into the longevity field as well. So there's there are deals closing. I mean, we saw twenty deals close in the last quarter, uh, categorizing within within longevity, um, but that's pretty much the same as Q one. So there's there's not really the momentum that we've all experienced, you know, in, in the in the 2020, 2021 periods. But uh, I guess, you know, it's going to change. We know it's going to happen. Uh, and I, I guess that the fact that you're going to be capitalized to do the things that you want to do, presumably you'll be waiting on your IPO uh, plans until you know, the market changes and everybody's a little happier with uh, what the exits look like. Yeah, a couple of things that I think are very important from the investing side of things. You know, um, I was presenting at a conference and I said, this to me is like, you, and being able to invest right now into anti-aging and, mo- and modifying and longevity is, to me, is it exactly the inflection point that had you been given the opportunity three or four years ago to invest in generated AI, I think it's going to have that sort of explosion. We're seeing it with some of Sinclair's work, 
We're seeing, I mm -hmm. think we're going to see some astonishing things out of Altos. Um, BioAge, there's a number of companies that are doing really compelling things right now that are going to explode onto the thing. I, and I'm not comparing us into the end game. I think generated AI, you know, has an, you know, enormous societal changes and economics associated with, but just as far as the trajectory of the curve for the next three to, you know, three is the next two or three years. So this is the, the time for me, I think, that to invest. If we were able to raise the 140 million that I've alluded to, 25 million will be dry powder to look for other things. We just think this is an extraordinary time. We have an amazing drug development team. We would have cash. And I think we would be enormously good partners for scientists or institutions that have compelling products. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so you, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of value in the, in the sector at the moment. You know, valuations are probably... At the bottom now, so so really, with your with your dry powder, you can go go hunting. Yeah, and you know, and, and I've my track record, whether it was Metivation or Biohaven, has always been to treat you know the founder, scientist, institutions well. I think the founders now have probably taken over two billion dollars off the table, and the institutions are well over one point six billion. So you know, treat them fairly, let them participate in the upside. I think is is definitely been my model historically and one I think will continue with juvenescence. Well, well, fascinating. And now, now obviously, Greg, you've got the uh, uh, speaker slot coming up at the Longevity Investors Conference in Switzerland. Yes. Um, you know, mixed mixed group of investors, you'll have family offices as well as VCs there. Um, you know, how are you finding talking with those at the moment that obviously that you are doing on a regular basis? You know, how are they responding? Um, VCs are trickier than the family offices. Um, <clears throat> the Family offices, I think, are more open to this. The VCs think that they can do it, it would, which may not is predicament for juvenescence, not necessarily a predicament for a single product company, because the VCs will say, you know, I don't need to invest in a platform company. I can pick off the ones I, I, I'm most excited about. And that's certainly been our discussion with a number of them. You know, I'd like I'll invest in this subsidiary, but I don't want to invest in the whole thing. The family offices are like, no, we uh, would be super excited to have a Richard Marshall, a Declan Dug, and a Greg Bailey, you know, picking the best products they can possibly find and investing in those. That's who you'd hire to have your diligence. It's probably who you'd hire to run your fund. So those, uh, it's a different, it's very different the way they look at it. And then the family offices, we talked to one of the fat, most the wealthiest families in the world. And the younger generation are very, very interested in longevity. Apparently, if you have a lot of money, you want to live longer. I know this may come as a shock to you, Phil, but uh, yeah, they're enjoying their time here. So um, yes, yeah, yeah, enjoy your wealth for as long as possible. I yeah. totally get that. Well, yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, the uh, the demographic, our, our demographic is, is millennial, you know, I mean, there are obviously a few boomers in our in our readership, but of course it is this next generation that's coming through because they understand wellness and they can understand uh, the benefit. Obviously, and they're going to be the ones that are paying the tax burden. That's <laughs> going to keep a lot of us uh, older folks looked after in our in our dotage. But um, Greg, you obviously you, you you refer there to of course the fact that you know you are managing other people's capital. You've got this very interesting hybrid model where you're helping with conversion and you're incubating and, and, and all of that. I mean, it, it, there's been a shift having watched Juvenescence over the years, but I, I'd be very interested just to understand where you are on the on the consumer side of the business, because of course there was that activity that you had with Metabolic Switch and those types of products. You know, are you moving into being pure play biotech or are you still working on consumer as well? So um, your timing's exquisite, Phil. Um, just yesterday we announced that we have relaunched Metabolic Switch's Cognitive Switch and now is probably the best tasting ketone ester in the world. Um, it tastes like a tropical yogurt drink. It's very, 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 very nice taste, which is tricky given what you're delivering to the body. And yet it has all the same things, 15 to 30 minutes of taking it, you're in ketosis, you're there for three to six hours. So we're very excited about that. And we're, we're doing a, a very strong push on the market um, for that product. The the biotech mafia, um, you know, they don't have, well, have any interest in consumer. You know, that's just we don't understand it. We don't know it. The consumer people, you know, it's nice that you've got these pharmaceuticals, but they're going to require so much money, you know, don't have interest in that. So we are beginning to separate. We will be spinning off a company called Synthetics, which is synthetic biology 
Uh, we have an, a mechanism for creating very, very high quality, pure products of supplements or drugs. And alongside that, we'll have our supplement company. So this would be a separate opportunity for people to invest in that, which would then mean that Juvenescence is by core, even though it alone 100% of synthetics before diluted by investors, will be focusing on drugs. It's what mm -hmm. Richard Marshall, Steve Felstad, Declan Dugan's background is. It fits very well. The metrics are very well understood by investors in this community. So, um, but I'm personally going to invest in synthetics. Um, of the 140 million we're trying to raise, we're actually only raising 100 million because I've invested 40 million personally to take myself to 75 million. I invest on the same terms as all the other investors in every round that we've done because of the inflection point. But to go back to consumer, I think it's going to be enormous. And the key thing here, and it was one of the things <clears throat> that delighted me about Richard when he joined, was he said, I get it. You know, there is going to be a blurring of the line between consumer and conventional pharmaceuticals. It's coming so fast, particularly the minute governments, insurance company, third party payers realize this is all about prevention. You know, and that changes it changes everything. You know, um, I just heard a staggering statistic by one of our consultants, Hugh Montgomery. He said that if British women read a bi rode a bicycle 1.7 kilometers, I guess that's about a mile and about a mile a day, seven minutes would be take take them even at a low pace to do that. They would lower their chance of breast cancer by 17 percent. This is so wow. important how we can change modify how you your trajectory of being healthy. And I think these products like Cognitive Switch, you know, are going to have a profound role. That's interesting. And so so just on Cognitive Switch, because of course, you know, this is very interesting. Your your I call it longevity now and longevity next, right? So the longevity next is all this sort of long big ticket, long scale uh, biotech. But of course there's this whole here and now longevity industry. But is is that gonna be like a medical food or is that actually gonna sit purely in that consumer supplement category? I don't know. You know, I mean I I'm interested to see how the regulatory bodies deal, how the first how the policymakers deal. You know, you have a time bomb, demographic time bomb with an inverted pyramid. What are you going to do, you know, to to offset that? You need healthy elderly people. And um, I know I would be drawn, quartered, shot, burned in France, but you're going to have to work past 64. You know, it, it, it's just going to be a different different world. So um, and they're going to have to embrace important prevention. And we know that there are products in the pipeline that are longevity products because they delay delay chronic disease. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a fascinating sort of existential as well as policy as well as financial argument, isn't it? Yeah, uh, Greg. But uh, you know, I guess uh, we're going to talk about this about this in detail uh, at the conference, and uh, so we'll be seeing each other in Gustad. And uh, really, thanks for all your insights today, Greg. It's great to see the progress that you're all making. Wonderful. I kick some of the question just quickly on your perspective. How do you think we get over this hump? Because it's my raison d'etre right now is trying to convince policymakers that the key to their economic stability is prevention. How do you think we make this transition? Uh, do you know what? I actually think um, the UK, not because I'm a Brit, I think the UK is going to be one of the uh, leading geographies where this happens. And uh, Greg, I'll tell you why. Um, there was a, I was on, listening to the radio bleary eyed one morning and uh, I heard about this obesity drug that uh, uh, the, the UK um, MHRA had signed off and the uh, nice guidelines and so forth had been agreed. And, and basically the UK was going to start prescribing this, this uh, obesity injection. And I was thinking, oh, that's really interesting. You know, you know, a few thousand here, a few thousand there. No, the UK government's going to be doing millions of these injections every year. Um, which I found actually as a precursor to a longevity, you know, heading off all of that diabetic, diabetic risk, really, really interesting. So we have a different uh, take in the UK on the infrastructure associated with prevention because it's a national, it's not a commercial thing like you have in the States where you've got insurance companies and it's different from federal government. This is totally integrated here. So I feel that the UK is actually going to pioneer a lot of these biotech uh, discoveries that are coming through 
obviously helping them through the MHRA to get into trials quicker. We've absolutely seen that happening where the UK is really helping. Uh, and I think that the UK and the government policymakers and the NHS are going to embrace it really quickly. So I actually think that we're going to get it. Ultimately, we're going to get it. And I think the UK will be a really interesting place to be. Yeah, I, I'm excited um, for Saudi Arabia because, you know, a very oh, few yeah. people could make a decision like that and then turn that on and they could lead the world. And and Switzerland has an opportunity. So we're meeting, we're going to be meeting in Switzerland. It would, you know, again, they have a population where it would be easy to implement this. So hopefully, and I, and think then, that, I think that's the point. Yeah. And I guess that the, you know, the drivers in the Middle East are, um, you know, obviously relating to, you know, diabetes and so on, which is really interesting um, as a pathway for, for other aging diseases. And yeah, and I guess to, to answer to my, to my uh, answer your question directly, it's going to happen, Greg, um, and it's going to be innovated and financed primarily out of the states. But I believe it's going to be executed outside of the states first, and I think we'll see it within the next five to ten years, absolutely at a, at a macro level. Got it. Um, I agree, and thank you very much. I've always enjoyed chatting with you. Congratulations on your website going through one point two five million. I guess last month. Well done, you. Yep. Yep, great. Well, Greg, I'll see you see you in Switzerland and thanks for your time today. Take care. All the best. Cheers.